Hello, everyone. It's Francis Widdowson here. Welcome to the Rational Space Disputations. We've had a bit of a break due to all the obligations on my time, but now I'm back at uh, this podcast. And my first guest that I'm going to have on is a former student of mine at Mount Royal University, Wyatt Claypool. Uh, welcome to the Rational Space Disputations, Wyatt. Yeah, it's fun to be one of the few people who doesn't have a PhD to come on the show. Oh, we have lots of people who yeah. don't have PhDs. Uh, we, we don't rely on authority. We look at, at reason, evidence, and logic. And for people who have not watched the disputations before, the format is for me to ask the guest questions for an hour. And then after an hour, to make things fair and to make sure everything has been covered, uh, the screens are turned and then the guests ask me questions for one hour. So um, before we get into the questions, Wyatt, uh, if you could just tell our audience what you're, what you're all about, what you're doing, what your background is, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I guess because just from being a student, of course, a lot of my background would be being a student in the policy studies uh, department of Mount Royal University. I did that, took that, took a minor in uh, history. I'm currently taking a master's degree at the UFC for public policy um, and a news organization, just a small online publication. So I guess you could say just even from when I was at Mount Royal, even before I started doing the journalism thing, my personality is always to investigate a, uh, a topic in all the sort of nooks and crannies I could find and sort of fully understand um, what's going on, which is why to a certain extent I've followed your case so closely because being sort of in the school's environment and knowing the sorts of things people say without evidence, without uh, actual like uh, experience with the, uh, with the subject matter being sort of like there's a hysteria about that always annoyed me. So I, I guess that my whole background has very much been uh, based heavily in just the idea of like wanting to actually know the full story, not just wanting to know narratives. Mm. And um, you're a, you're currently a student at the University of Calgary. Yeah, yeah, it's just a one year degree for uh, public policy. Just a uh, just their master's program involves a research paper, four semesters over a year. And uh, what years were you a student at Mount Royal University? That, that was 2017 to 2021, I believe, or no, so to, uh, early 2022. I just took an extra year to do a couple last minute classes uh, just to finish things up. But it was effectively just a four year degree. Yes. And uh, I believe you uh, you're a conservative. Is that correct? Yeah, I would be I would be considered uh, I guess you would consider me like a uh, or not not you personally, but people out there would consider me as some nasty neoconservative. Yes. Um, so, what would you say your uh, your position is, or what what are you, what's your idea? What are your ideas? What are your sort of primary ideas that you espouse? Well, yeah, I'd be like what you would consider like not trying to be too dogmatic about this, but I'd be a very anti-populist conservative. I like ideas that work. I like sort of uh, things that have been proven over time. I'm not someone who'd get into as much of the populist crowd of, of uh, whatever sort of like the people want kind of a thing. Cause even that regardless of or on the left or the right movements like that pop up all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd be someone who like would be more hawkish on foreign policy, a uh, fiscally, a uh, very fiscally conservative, more socially conservative at this uh, as well. Mm -hmm. While and also still having libertarian kind of beliefs mixed in there. Okay, so um, uh, like, do you have socially conservative uh, views? Yes, I would generally have, yeah, like personally socially conservative views. Okay, so so you think that, you know, abortion should be illegal perhaps or no? Yeah, yeah, like, oh, like I would say that people say, oh, I'm pro-life. I just say I'm anti-abortion. <laughs> That's usually okay. where, where my position would be. Okay, and uh, drugs, what's your view on drugs? Uh. I'd just say anything that's currently illegal, probably we've survived with it being illegal. So there's no point in legalizing and having another can of worms to open up. So I'd, I'd be the type of person when I say, see uh, Premier David Ebby in British Columbia decriminalizing meth and heroin and stuff like that. I'm like, 
it's silly. It's not like those are things that we need or we have there's any sort of medical purpose for them. So yeah. just simply decriminalizing something that only has the uh, that really it only has the risk of addiction seems a little foolish to me, despite the fact that I would say like, well, you know, marijuana is currently legal, so I don't see the any reason to, you know, put to get put all the mechanisms in place to try and ban it again and try and get rid of all the shops that we already have set up. Like it, it would be impractical at this point to try and uh, control that. Even yes. though I would have been someone who during a referendum, I'd say I'd vote against it because we've survived so long with it being not legal. It's kind of like, I guess you could say I'm very pragmatic in that sense mm. when it comes to drug policy. Yes. And is there a, a politician who you support, who you think is like the best person to get behind currently? Oh, uh, I guess a good person to just name just because I appreciate the fact that he is so detail oriented and I think people should go watch watch interviews with him and maybe see what he's all about is someone like Jim Carajalios, the current leader of the new blue party in Ontario. And then he also, mm -hmm. um, he also like ran for the conservative leadership in 2020, but he was kicked out of that for criticizing someone for being in favor of Sharia law. And then he also has, uh, he was also the person who was the pioneer behind the Axe the Carbon Tax campaigns all over Canada when he challenged current uh, the previous PC leader, Patrick Brown, over uh, his inclusion of a carbon tax into the PC platform at the time. He actually won a lawsuit against Patrick Brown uh, at the oh, time because yeah. he had the PC party sue him for standing up to the party on that issue. It, mm. he, his his he, even though not a lot of people know him his his background is crazy and all the stuff he's uh had happened to him yeah i don't i've never even heard of him I, that's kind of interesting that he's sort of uh, you yeah. know slipped past my radar Chantel Paffel that you've had on i believe oh, she yeah, would yeah. know him quite well oh, yeah. a lot oh, of yeah. other people have uh discussed uh education policy with him from ontario i think uh i'm not sure if james Pugh would know him but a lot of those people okay. out east would uh, be familiar with the new blue parties take on, um, on like on education policy. One of the things they did is they were the only party in the provincial legislature to vote against critical race theory being included in schools. Uh, even someone from another party that was supposedly the real alternative conservative party of the Ontario party, they actually had their one MPP vote for critical race theory and then they had to take it back after but it was only Jim's wife Belinda Carajalios who voted against it she was the only uh, new blue MPP but you know fair enough yeah you still get points for being the only one yeah and um, actually made the PCs back down so they actually on third reading uh scrapped it after she put a lot of attention on the fact that they were going to approve this NDP proposal so we're gonna just bracket your political beliefs because uh I just want to give people a little bit of a background. I believe you were in the conservative students club or something at Mount Royal. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a, it's always weird being in clubs at Mount Royal because it's such a commuter school. Not many people live on campus. People drive home and they don't really come back. But I was the, the vice president of the conservative club for a bit. Then I was the president, frankly, because no one else wanted to do it. And, you know, I hosted uh, the Fraser Institute for a talk on debt and deficits at one point then 2020 hit and nobody wanted to leave their homes so that i my, <laughs> my tenure as president was very short-lived uh because of unforeseen circumstances all right and um you were a you're you're you you're a journalist right you're you were a student journalist and probably a journalist now right yeah because yeah, i'd be one of the people like who i, I co-own the National Telegraph with uh, Daniel Boardman. We do a lot of stuff on, you know, just conservative cultural stuff. We also were like, we'd be the type of publication who during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we wouldn't talk about vaccines all day long, like a lot of other independent media would. We like, in Alberta's context, we focused on AHS mishandling ICU beds and not being honest about the way that they were using them. And that actually eventually got Dr. Verna U fired from her job as the AHS CEO, simply because all we did was focus on an issue that we knew that whether you were for vaccines, against vaccines, for lockdowns, against lockdowns, you yeah. could agree that maybe we should be using more than 250 ICU beds when we have access to hundreds more. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so that gives us a bit of background. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, with you about your Mount Royal experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll still because say it's I think overall as positive. A student, as a student, a former student, because you're not a student there anymore, right? Okay, because I don't want to, I don't want you to be, I don't want to be kind of bringing in a student who's there right now. Um, so 
what what's your like you were there for four five years as a student what what was your uh sense of the the climate the intellectual climate uh the ability to discuss ideas uh amongst the student body uh at mount royal especially in the policy studies department uh, i also interacted with of course people from the history department having gotten a minor from there but the funny, the thing about it that's very stark is that there's a lot of people who are very just academically focused. They're there to get their degree. They will discuss any idea with you because, hey, I'm at university. I should be able to discuss things. And they're not even philosophically like, uh, like uh, philosophical about it. They, they're just there to get their degrees. They're there to le learn skills. And then you get people who are very intense about what you should uh, say, what you should study and whatnot. It was very... Um, it was very strange how there wasn't really uh, people. It wasn't like there was people on one side who are very uh, anti-academic freedom and people who are very pro-academic freedom on a campus like Mount Royal because there wasn't really that campus community the same way there is on campuses where there's tens of thousands of students who live in residencies. I know there's a lot of universities that even make first year students live in residency, uh, whereas Mount Royal, I found that there was an activist set. I used to work at the, the student union for a while, and there was very much a either you were part of the student union kind of orbit, which is a very small set of students, or you were just there to take your classes, you're just there to take your degree. And I would say the vast majority of people on, on campus were very pleasant to talk to. They were very productive students who cared about, uh, you know, academic coherency to the to ideas they wanted, you know, evidence and whatnot. Again, not philosophically, they weren't going to like, you know, to, no one, there wasn't a lot of, uh, as you would remember, there wasn't a lot of protests in favor of Francis Widowson of saying, we want academic freedom. It's a very low key campus, but um, mm -hmm. I would say that most people are honest about it, but the vast, there's a minority of people who are very loud and very, um, I feel like socially motivated for for like opposing certain ideas. It's not, not intellectual motivation, it's always social, emotional motivation. Yes. And what what ideas did you find they were most opposed to being expressed? Well, it would be something along the lines of, honestly, I can use a lot of your kind of uh, your events that you would put on with, with the Rational Space Network as examples of what would really kind of uh, trigger negative responses from this crowd of people where if you you could talk about, you know, fiscal issues all day long, you could talk about a lot of different sort of just generic political uh, organizations, capitalism versus socialism, that wouldn't really get people too riled up in any way. Mm. But what they would really, really focus on is when uh, anything involved a minority group or minority religious belief or some form of spiritual belief. So if you talk about anything to do with diversity and inclusion, uh, transgenderism, if you talk about Islam, if you talk about anything else, or if you, if, you talk, if you bring up the subject of Israel, you'd also get a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to not say <laughs> very nice things about Israel or Jews, that you're allowed to dislike Jews in the policy <laughs> studies department from my experience for some reason, uh, but you couldn't, but anything else was very off limits if it wasn't some sort of European dominant cultural um, sort of uh, symbol or idea. Yes. Uh, what about indigenous uh, politics? Yeah, yeah, that's that would fit within the minority beliefs and spiritualism. That that would be considered something off limits. I I even sat on the um the the Mount Royal Student Association Academic Advisory Committee, and it was frankly insulting the kind of conversations I would hear where people would speak about. Uh, students of minority background as if they actively cannot achieve even though people from the background were on that advisory board they would speak as if other people from their communities are just simply not uh the same way as like a white student would be which i always found kind of like a little bit strange that they would speak in such a way in like a private setting where you don't really have to put on a front and they were they were not a minority themselves they were a white person some were minorities and some of them were not but my point was is that they can it was very strange how 
even though in their own life experience, they know a lot of the stuff about how, well, you have to have, you have to work harder than, you know, white students, you have to do all the stuff better or whatever, uh, that the, the university somehow systemically raised it. They would know it's not just based on the fact that they are in elected positions a lot of the time in the student union. They have a lot of power. They tend to do very well in classes. They've never been personally held back. They're even held in higher esteem by many faculty members, yet they would still just based on the ideas that were kind of, I guess, fashionable on campus, they would still look at other minority students and say, well, that person has it hard and that person's not going to achieve like other people are. Yes. So you were on the student uh, association. You were, you were uh, a member of that. The I'm not sure. What was your, what were your positions? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it would have been a... It would put on the vice president academics advisory committee, which would also have, which is also why I would had access to going to general faculty council meetings, business faculty council, arts faculty council, because I was there to, you know, represent the student position, which I always found kind of frustrating because I think I was like one of the only people who would actually represent what, uh, what students wanted. And you'd have a lot of people representing what, uh, I guess, a campus social disturber would want <laughs> yeah. so I, i'd be the type of person like hey guys it's it wasn't it was before covid but i was like hey guys if we're talking about tuition freezes uh the tuition freeze being lifted as such a bad thing maybe we should also try and cut back on the cost that samru takes from students which no student gets barely any benefit from and they're like that's insane i can't believe you <laughs> suggested that it's our right yeah, to well, steal three hundred dollars uh, a day these these student presidents and so on like they get paid my understanding is that they get paid a lot of money is that correct forty thousand dollars a year and they get a $40, lot of dollars <laughs> yeah they get a lot of stuff comped for them like i don't think yeah. those are the type of people that i don't think they would actually have to pay for food if they didn't want to kind of a thing yeah. it's very it's very i would get the impression not to not to rag on them but i would get the impression it's a fairly cushy job you got your own office uh your actual goals you had to achieve in a year were fairly mild and you could probably get away with never actually having done anything because that's the problem with advocacy positions mm -hmm. in universities is that yeah. you're oh, so many of the people that occupy them are in favor of the status quo or pressured into being in favor of the extremely socially progressive status quo so yeah. when i say socially progressive I, i'm more so talking about you know what what we're probably talking about here in terms of you're in favor of indigenization, you're in favor of diversity, equity, and inclusion sorts yeah. of initiatives. And as a student activist, you know, you're in favor of all the things the university is already doing. And all your job is really to do is get into meetings with people and say, we want more. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that that's interesting. And that's my understanding that not very many people vote in these student elections. Is that correct? I tried to run for the uh, Samaru board at one time and I got clobbered because I found out the only people who vote in these elections, no matter how many people I told about it, are people who work for Samaru or are involved in some intimate way with Samaru. Yeah, I heard 7% of students vote in the elections. That's a high estimate. Is that a high estimate? Like, it's like 3%. <laughs> it's probably not even that. It, it's it's actually kind of embarrassing. And I always hear that it's supposed to be better at the UFC. I think 7% might be like the UFC's number. Yeah. Yeah, because this is a major area of interest of mine is these student associations and their role in kind of maintaining the current um, uh, woke kind of environment. Uh, and I'm just going to use the term woke for people who don't. I, I never liked using the term woke historically, but everyone has caught on to this and it's impossible to use any other term. Um, but wokeism is uh, an academic, just a, my own definition is drawn from Helen Pleckrose and James Lindsay's book, Cynical Theories. And they say that wokeism is what they call reified postmodernism, which is a, uh, a when you have subjectivity, which is prized over objectivity. And the insistence is, is that you must accept the subjective beliefs of members of groups who are perceived to be oppressed. And doing so will empower these groups and enable them to thrive in t today's society. So, um, and that's why some of the things that you were mentioning, um, trans activism, Islam, um, Palestinian rights, um, 
uh, indigenization and so on, like members of those groups are are perceived to be oppressed and therefore anything they say should must be agreed with and not argued with yeah. because if you if you deny their view um you are aiding in their oppression um anyways the students associations across the country are all the people who are in control of these students associations just deeply hold these this kind of viewpoint and because of that they are resistant to open inquiry in universities and and that's that's what i meant when i said that they it's so dogmatic that you could be a black student president like a black female student president who's disabled and mm. you would still you could, you've been elevated to the highest student position on campus you're well respected among the faculty you get paid a handsome salary to do what is not even that difficult a job yet you would still be the sort of person uh to stand up and say you know well it's black uh black females who are most oppressed on this campus even though it's just by their own experience which they value personal experience by their own experience it's just wrong it's it's mm -hmm. like that the situation on Ever evergreen state college to so the two people who, who were the ones who were uh <laughs> the, the ring leaders of it were uh were like two black students and they were saying that it's a racist campus yet almost like 80 percent of the students are following the lead of them it's so yeah. strange that yeah. Uh, that you can be somehow oppressed in the most powerful person on campus as a student. Yes. Um, are, 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 I assume you're familiar with the Everstein State College case. You made me familiar with it. I, I watched through all the videos on it. <laughs> oh, like, because I think for people who have not seen Benjamin Boyce's 24 part uh, documentary, I think it's required required watching uh, to get an understanding because when I watched those 24 episodes, I started to get chills because I saw things that, that were quite similar. And actually Lathbridge, when I just went through it, Lathbridge had had elements of this and Evergreen is, is like the, the extreme. So that's where it go. It's going in that direction. And it it's kind of this accusations, constant accusations that there's this rampant oppression and racism and so on happening, yet no one ever specifies what they're talking about. Like there's always these vague references, but you never get past this, these kind of vague allegations. And then we had Evergreen, these, these students saying that they feared being killed when they would come on campus and they were walking around with baseball bats. <laughs> well, and, and this is a where real kind of dynamic. And this this whole thing, of course, happened on Mount Royal's campus when it came to anything you talked about, anything you did. Everyone yeah. had accusations. No one had ever yeah. actually seen anything you've done. A lot of people have never taken class. I've even had people who would who would be the types of students to say that, you know, Francis Widowson is a racist and they'd say in the most earnest way possible. Yet if you talk to them for a few minutes, you'd be like, well, Francis was one of the, probably the most fair markers of all the professors. And they'd be like, well, yeah, she was actually really good, a really good professor, but you know, she's a terrible <laughs> person. It'd be like, it, it, this is where people don't really understand how cognitive dissonance works. They assume that people's nonsensical beliefs have to be more rational than they are. It's like, no, people at Evergreen State College and Mount Royal, like let's just say, put the Mount Royal thing. People can a hundred percent in their minds or the in their minds believe that Francis Widowson is a racist, while also knowing they're lying when they say it, knowing that they've never actually seen anything. Is that people can literally be holding two contradictory beliefs at once and mm -hmm. not understand that somehow that these two things cannot fit together? There's so many people who are like that. Where if you ask them well, what did Francis say? It would turn into, well, I never took her class, but my friend said that this happened. And then if you went down the line a lot enough, it's that, well, no, I never saw her. I've never seen an interview of hers. I've never read her book. I've never been to her class. But a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend said that this person said that she's like a terrible person or uh, they'll just Google search and know here's one line of a book that I never read. And that's something that you should now like, you know, condemn her based on. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it was kind of disturbing for me. I'm, and the thing that reminded me a little bit of Evergreen, uh, I'm not sure if you went to this, but it's on the internet. 
um, there was an event that was held, and I'm currently writing about this and linking it up to the Evergreen situation because I, I haven't really written, written very much about the students associations, which I think are a major part of what's going on in universities. But it was called um, The Loudest Silence, Anti-Racism Open Mic. Did you did you see that uh, event? I don't think I have. Oh, you should watch that event. I'm going to post a link uh, in the in this 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 uh, in this episode because I'm currently writing about this. Anyway, in March 2021. So I I've been embroiled in stuff since I guess it started around June June 2020. Uh, with the after the George Floyd and everything started to go off the rails and and I was still thinking that it could be pushed back against and trying to think of new ways of confronting all the craziness. Um, anyway, then I got embroiled in all these harassment uh, investigations and whatnot. And then in March 2021, after the, this is concerted effort to try to get me fired for a number of months, um, and it was like it seemed to me that the the, the event was held. To, to some extent, in response to my, you know, activities, anti uh, anti indigenous rhetoric was was the language that was used. But no one ever said what was anti indigenous rhetoric or anything. Anyway, they had these students uh, come on. Uh, they weren't allowed to mention any names, <laughs> and they talked about all their terrible racist experiences that they had had at Mount Royal. And basically, there was there's one student I was very, very sad to see because she was a very, very good student and was just obviously, you know, kind of started to kind of think the things that I was saying uh, were had had these negative things that she needed to push back against. And one of them was the developmental difference between indigenous and non-indigenous societies, that is hunting and gathering versus modern nation states. The other was um, using the word Indian. Um, like, and I was arguing in the class that because it's legislation, like the Indian Act, then one should be able to refer to the word Indian in talking about the Indian Act, not you can call some, you should call someone an Indian. It was just like, this is a description. So this is kind of a bit of a misunderstanding. Anyway, she thought this was terrible that it happened to my, <laughs> and I never, I don't think I'd ever talked about the developmental gap in my classes because I intentionally avoided staying away from the indigenous area because I knew this was becoming more and more fraught and I didn't want students to be kind of trapped in that kind of situation. Anyway, the biggest complaint that happened in the whole two hours of this event was that students were not having their names pronounced correctly. Like that was again and again and again that their names are not being mispronounced. And I was going, you know, this is a common thing that happens because you have like 90 students you're you're interacting with and you're going to have quite a few international students of languages you're not familiar with. So obviously, you know, mispronunciation of names is going to be quite common, but it's not an intentional slight. It, it's yeah. just like difficulties. And then so I was hoping that the grownups in the room would sort of make some kind of commentary about this. But the three grown-ups, the president of the faculty association, the president of the staff association, and the vice president of student affairs, the registrar's office, all went, oh, yes, yes, we feel your pain. This is terrible. Oh, you you know, you poor students, your names are... <laughs> I was watching this going, oh, like this is just going to kind of accelerate this kind of, you know, hysteria almost. When it's just kind of a w very well understood phenomenon, which is not like trying to insult people or trying to um, harm them in any way, it's just an it's a it's an understandable kind of problem which we we should have a little bit of tolerance for instead of you know railing against quote unquote racism as being the cause of this. Well, I think I think what you end up getting a lot, and this is kind of worked into one of the uh, and uh, sort of tying this back in with also student unions and some of the events. I remember the event you had between uh, Megan Murphy, the debate between Megan Murphy and I forget the other panelists, but it was a, an Julie event. Julie Ray Goldstein. Yeah, Julie Ray Goldstein, and it was a, an event just debating 
uh, you know, keeping women's spaces for biological women and whether or not we should be using, you know, like trans pronouns and whatnot and all this sort of other stuff. And the funny thing is Megan Murphy is not even like someone who's uh, a particularly strident, she's not a strident social conservative by any means. She just, she's, her position is very flatly just like women's spaces should be for women. And I'm totally fine on, you know, respecting your identity, but, you know, I want to protect certain things. Very mild, but just the fact that you could tell that there was faculty members at that particular event with members of the student union, including student union presidents and other sorts of VPs showed up simply to be angry at the fact the event had even happened. And I know this is actually, this is caught on the recording of that event that you posted on YouTube, but I, it, but when you're actually there in person, I was sitting at the very back, it, it was hilarious to see the student union president and all the different student uh, groups and activists show up and then claim that they are somehow being like oppressed or somehow it was rude that the that the event was being filmed that, that there was a camera in the room and it wasn't even your camera filming the audience it was someone filming like a documentary of some sort i think i remember yet everyone's so upset despite that the fact that they voluntarily put themselves in this situation and that is almost like the the entire character of a lot of this sort of campus hysteria is it's that people putting themselves in situations that they have chosen and them mm -hmm. having to make a mountain of a molehill at the time. And it's almost like they get high off of seeing uh, the, uh, like off of seeing other campus movements on other campuses. Like I'm not, this isn't a shot at Mount Royal. I, I tend to like the education. I like the smart classes and whatnot, but it's like they want to have this campus activist culture the way like a uc berkeley or an evergreen would have so it's it's even more sad because you can tell that they're just grasping at straws and just mm -hmm. trying to find even the the tiniest little kind of uh like misheard words and whatnot it's very very petty to, uh to a large extent and a lot of the time like that student you're describing i think a lot of them don't even know what they're actually complaining about they're just told to complain because that's what the most engaged people on campus do and that's honestly why the, the, it's sort of sad that we don't have a more robust club culture on mount royal is that the only ones that are active are effectively the activist organizations mm. so that's the only and you're like a lot of the other clubs don't really do that much. So if you want to be involved in campus and there are people who just have the personalities that they do what is the socially acceptable uh, thing to do. If you're sort of like a joiner type person, someone who really wants to get involved, you the thing you get involved in is like protesting professors, getting mad, angry at the at events are <laughs> happening and whatnot. It, 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 and that's, that, that's what's funny about it. It's, it's no longer activism. It's just joining the Boy Scouts and getting your pins. For, uh, for standing up against uh, a, a fake ch uh, set up challenges and fake challenges. Yeah, and, and I, I think this is quite common uh, with, amongst young people. I'm just thinking back to my own experiences. You know, you do get a certain thrill out of, you know, opposing and being, active, being an activist and so on. And not that I did it that much myself, but I did, you know, I, I was involved a little bit at University of Victoria. The, the problem though is like, you expect this to happen with students. So that's like, and it's not a big deal. It's fine. Like I, like even Lethbridge, which was <laughs> a bit insane. I, I, it's like, you know, like I think it's good people can express themselves and, you know, you can't be saying, oh, well, I would really like you to express yourself in this in this kind of way, because then you're controlling things and you want people to be sincere and, and do things, even if it's if you think it's a bit misguided. The problem is the authority figures <laughs> who are using the students like this is kind of the most frustrating thing is that they don't do it themselves they get the students in front of them and then pretend it's the students that are doing it. And this makes it a very, very difficult situation for professors who are under fire because it makes it seem like you are an enemy of the students and you are opposing the students when really it's a faculty on faculty dispute or potentially it's a faculty on administration dispute. But a lot of the times it's faculty on faculty. And we saw that with that. And that was an event on March 15th, uh, 2019. Does trans activism negatively impact women's rights? 
And there were some professors in the crowd, and I'm not going to mention who they were, who were egging on the students and they're wanting to have the cameras turned off, which was a completely insincere um, kind of demand because what happened is that one of my colleagues was there and she offered to hold a microphone in the back of the room so that students who didn't want to be shown on camera could go and ask a question without having to be filmed. And then none of them did it. So they all went to the camera. <laughs> so they all went to the camera. So that meant that it obviously wasn't a major issue for them. And then after actually making that compromise, the Students Association went to the Dean and tried to get the Dean to get me to not post the video on the YouTube channel. So the whole thing was, you know, really not sincere and was just an attempt to obstruct things. And instead of the administration and the faculty members, you know, being professionals and not pandering to this kind of narcissism, they, you know, they were right in there. So like this is kind of the difficulty is is that the using of students. Which and the funny thing is when they went to the dean and not that I'm familiar with the situation, more so just the pattern of it, even even when the dean probably said, I'm not I can't make her not post that video. They probably just walked away from there, not really caring. The whole point is it's just performatively being outraged by different things. It's what this one guy, I, I he's a really good YouTube channel, mostly about crime issues. His name's Sean Fitzgerald, is like the actual Justice Warrior channel. But he, he was talking about how like he's really sick of how we have this chitter chatter culture in the West where you just you're saying things, you're doing things, not because you actually care about it, but because you gotta get you gotta kind of like pose as being very uh, caring you got to be sort of like be involved in the emotional battle even though you could be you could care less and you could even just tell by the way a lot of these people kind of I was actually just on at MRU's campus the other day it was just it was just some some sort of like uh, it was this generation screwed event I just decided to show up it's uh it's an organization about being against like government overspending and deficits and debt and whatnot and I, I we had the student walk up to us and this is what I've seen so many times they walk up to you pretending to be completely disinterested in the subject that they're confronting you about, even though you can tell that they're seething and they're just there to talk to you enough and pretend like every single, single thing you're saying is ridiculous until they've given themselves the win in their head. And then they walk away. It's the most artificial kind mm -hmm. of uh, the, the most artificial kind of an interaction I've ever felt I've ever seen yet. They feel like they're somehow gaining social points through what is like effectively to make a uh, reference to, the native culture is like count it's like it's this counting coup ritual they're going through of just sort of like tapping you with a stick and then running away and pretending that they've somehow uh, been extremely brave yes well it's it's kind of a as you say i think it does have a performative character you act like you won the you know and you see this on social media all the time you know like this this kind of oh i destroyed this person or what and then you walk away and or oh, oh, my favorite on social media is when someone you know makes some comment and then you you reply just by asking a question about what they're talking about you haven't even said anything nasty and they just block you immediately so you yeah. like you get like it, it's like they want to just put forward this point they don't want any questions that's the end of it. They've shown the right position and no more discussion, uh, which I think is kind of a, the nature of this kind of vice that we're starting to feel our, our, ourselves in. Um, so um, just so I don't not get to this. So you were in the, in the Students Association. You were involved in the uh, ad academic advisory, the vice president academic advisory uh, committee is that correct yeah, yeah academic advisory council but i would i would uh, attend no. meetings of just students to talk about like gfc agendas and different things like that and then we would also go to the actual you know arts faculty council general faculty council library standing committee kind of meetings on our own time like usually a couple of us were assigned to all of them but we all went to our own student meetings where it was just the students we also went and had a monthly meeting with the president and provost and the uh, chair of gfc and how were those, Wyatt? <laughs> I I don't know. The funny thing is that you'd like I I I you'd be surprised about how 
boring they were. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times, like, I, I know that, that you're familiar with one recording of a uh, moment in that, uh, in those meetings. A yes. lot of it was just kind of, again, like, like that, that meeting. It's a lot of chitter chatter kind of people trying to talk about how tolerant they are and how we're a school that believes in this and I've been to every pride parade and blah 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 and, and it's like there was very much just like the honestly it just kind of showed how hollow student interests actually were the, it yeah. was almost like they just read a and I'm not, not trying to take a shot at them but they read an NDP press release on tuition freezes and they would say we're very concerned about tuition freezes and the school's like well we can't do anything about it and then like you'd have the president be like but we're still very concerned I'm like well what, what's the point of this this is the most worthless meeting I've ever been to and I'm not I'm not trying to attack too many people on GSC like, of course I'm not gonna not, just to be not be rude not to say anyone's name but I remember there's so many times in GFC I'm like how are we how, like I'm not even sure this is a real meeting uh, there was one time someone had asked for money from the university because they were going to do a field trip for a class about shopping like literally just retail shopping in a mall and I'm like how is this a class yet mm. we're always so, so concerned about other sorts of resources for students and how there's not enough mental health care kinds of resources even though our campus is absolutely chock full of them it it's kind of ridiculous and all the the different sorts of accommodations we would constantly talk about that that's what I mean it's almost hard to sum up what the president meetings were like in the student association kind of council meetings because they were always about issues that they're they're like you know very broad the way they discuss them but they were not deep at all they were yeah. like a deep as a puddle and we just talk about how oh well, you know students who have like a nervous energy or anxiety don't have enough extra hours for writing tests and I'm like I always just thought that that was kind of insulting. I'm like, don't you think that you should be able to like, you know, if you're truly qualified in the program area that you are in, of course, there's certain people that genuinely should get a, uh, an accommodation just because of a problem that, allow that causes them to take a little bit longer on a test. But they were, they would throw out accommodations to anyone. You could literally just go and ask for an accommodation, not even to say what it was for, and they would have to give it to you. Because the student association, certain faculty members were pushing the idea that it was insulting to ask someone what the disability that they had was that required them double time on a test. Mm. So, Wyatt, I wanted to ask you specifically about that meeting. And we can talk about this because the president at the time, David Doherty, is no longer at Mount Royal. So uh, I think that's a safe kind of area, but I thought that was very interesting. So for people who are unfamiliar about this situation, um, a recording of that, and it's uh, unfortunately it's a bit faint, um, but I did a transcript of it, uh, of the recording uh, of a, this, this uh, Vice President Academic Advisory Council um, where Dr. Do David Doherty, president of Mount Royal, came to talk to this council about general general's faculty council, something to do with general faculty council. Can you just tell the audience what happened in that? Uh, you were there. You were present. Yeah. You were present it, at that meeting. Yeah, it was a long enough that I, I ended up recording it simply because it went on so long where they were just <laughs> talking about, like, what they were talking about is just, like, they're, like, all, they're all kind of, like, coaxing themselves into the hot tub of censorship, like slowly getting acclimatized to when they're just going to say like, you know, basically they're all the entire clip when you listen to it is about people being in favor of censorship, but they're kind of talking themselves in with soft language into the fact that what we need is more censorship. So like the whole clip starts off with uh, with David Doherty, the former president talking about, well, I've been in, I've marched in every pride parade. I've been doing all these other things and whatnot. And it was like it, it's like it's so it's so paranoid that the way that a lot of faculty members and executives of the university act around students that they have to show their they have to dump all their credentials on the table all the time in order mm. to speak to people. It, it's like we never oftentimes meetings, I feel like if in general faculty council and these little side meetings I'd be a part of, we're so based on all of the sort of performative uh, kind of like checklists people would do. But what people are saying in the recording is how, well, you know, we have too much dissent. There's too many people who <laughs> want to keep talking about issues after we've decided that it, we should be, ha we should, it should be all done. So I think it was specifically about the land acknowledgement 
uh, in this 2018 meeting that they were talking about how we're still arguing about indigenization and, and why we should be doing a land acknowledgement when we should be doing it because it's just the right thing to do, which doesn't really exa exactly seem like a great explanation for me. But yeah. they, but yeah, like it, it's, it's blatantly just saying that you shouldn't be allowed to talk about maybe why we should or should not be doing land acknowledgements after we've had the general faculty council vote on it, which I didn't understand. I didn't know that the general faculty council had the ability to restrict what people can and can't say based on what we've already uh, legislated, which is funny because any of these issues can always be brought up again. So it's sort of silly that you're not allowed to talk about it, which kind of under undermines the ability to change rules and policies in the future. But at one point, they even refer to like, well, you know, the gen the makeup of general faculty council this year is so much better. We don't have to talk about whether the earth is flat or not. And the only person who had basically changed out of GFC was Francis. <laughs> and the, the, so they, they the, the funny thing is they're in a meeting where I, they all know what they're talking about, but they yeah. don't want to say it because I, it, it's not a meeting where they assume anyone's recording in any way, but you can tell that nobody can admit to themselves that they're just against you being able to talk. So they have to, again, use very expansive, vague language in order to get around all these sort of uh, rough edges of what they're actually inferring uh, and what, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, no, I found that that recording to be quite shocking for two reasons. One is the president of a university actively encouraging students to sort of you know, be critical of a professor, right? And to, to, and it was Doherty actually who said it felt like that we were having discussions about whether the earth was, was flat or round, which is a complete, like to say that is comparable to having arguments about whether, um, for example, territorial land acknowledgements should be uh, official ones, not to say it, individuals can't, if they want to do it, fine, but to have official ones, which rope everyone into faculty council into agreeing with this, you know, what is a highly, you know, you know, political kind of statement, which you may or may not agree with. And there was a bunch of other different issues that we talked about, such as prayers, whether we should have prayers at the beginning of meetings. Also, a student was punished for saying some you know critical things about islam in a you know a somewhat you know not i think we remember that it was like they i think they technically did write on like a wall of the school and it's like and i i think that people I, there was actually a little bit more rationality around that issue i remember yeah. that people yeah. were at very least saying hey well yeah like they can say what they want just don't vandalize the school that was the thing is that just well, don't we never did get to the bottom of it because David Doherty and I wrote about this in the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship newsletter. He said that you can criticize Islam. You just have to do it respectfully. And I couldn't get it out of him whether he was talking about the language that was being used or whether it was, you know, writing about it in an inappropriate place. Like you, you write on, on a blackboard or you have a poster that you put up on a wall or what like you don't have authorization to do this or was it the kind of language like for example islam is cancer i believe was one of the so i'm saying you know i've heard richard dawkins and sam harris say similar things about religion or islam you know are we allowed is anyone is are people going to be prohibited from saying islam is cancer and we never we never did get that sorted out. So th those were the kinds of arguments that I was trying to have at General Faculty's Council. And then to hear the president kind of comparing this to, you know, discussing whether the earth is flat or round, uh, like is... This might <laughs> have not been the same meeting. Insulting. This might have not been in the same meeting where I was uh, recording it. It might have been a different meeting with the president, which makes all this very ironic because I remember I was in a, uh, I was in a meeting where I think for a good like five, six, seven minutes, they were just talking about how Baptist Christians are all Southern hicks and whatnot and oh, yeah. unintelligent people. And it's like, well, <laughs> like, goodness, based on your own rules, you guys all have to go cancel yourselves unless your rule is so arbitrary that it only applies to Islam. But well, uh, wokeism. don't forget wokeism, though, which is like a Baptist Christian is not one of the protected kind of groups. So you can slam, you know, all these people who are perceived to be the oppressors as much as you want. But if you start to argue with someone who's claiming to have this per oppressed positionality, that's going to be a completely different kind of situation. So, which of course makes it very difficult because 
you have this, the sands are shifting in terms of who right now is perceived as being the most oppressed kind of identity. That could change depending upon the, the nature of all these kind of political kinds of uh, circumstances. So in terms of that recording, the first thing was, you know, David Doherty doing this, which I thought this is really not a very good thing for a president to be doing. And if presidents are doing this, which I think they are doing this quite a lot, this gives you a bit of a sense of why the students are so emboldened. Okay. Secondly, the point that you made, which I think is very, very important, that it's been decided. And we can't talk about this anymore. This is a very anti-intellectual kind of stance, which assumes that there's a, a truth that has been found. And now it's just a matter of just kind of uh, inculcating it into everyone's kind of psyche when like it's possible that what we're doing right now is misguided and is going to have negative yeah. implications. And if we're not able to revisit that and discuss it, uh, once the decision has been made, we're never going to be able to change any of the mistakes that have been made. And here's a here's an example where this is also another aspect of the tape I'd want to touch on. And like the thing is, I don't even really have anything personally against David Dockery. I've actually I, th I think I met him outside of the university situation before, and he was he's fine to talk to. I even like this is another person who has left the university. I thought Leslie Brown was a fairly decent pro host. No, not everyone liked her or whatever. And there's a lot of complaining. I always felt that the complaining usually was that they weren't bending towards the needs of like uh, a minority of faculty members. So, but the thing is what you could tell is is with David in this tape is that he could, he was being effectively almost bullied or pushed into being more and more uh, dogmatic about uh, what the students wanted him to say as the tape went on. Because at the start, he's just justifying himself that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we should shut anything down. I've, hey, I've marched in every pride parade. I'm very progressive. Hey, what, uh, don't worry about me. And then he goes on to, as the students are keep saying, well, you know, well, at some point we need to be able to end the discussion. Then he kind of is like trying to mirror what they say, where before at the start of the tape, he's less pro-censorship than he is by the end of the tape. It's very, it's very funny that way is that it's that this, even though the students have zero power in a certain sense, and frankly, students should generally not have that much power. You're paying to get a degree. You're not, this isn't exactly your home. Uh, you don't work here. Whereas the, the university is very much scared of the minority of students who are very into this, you know, very woke, uh, progressive kind of uh, these viewpoints. So that he's going from just sort of softly saying, yeah, it was unfortunate the way GSE went to, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. We need to be able to end discussion at some point. And there are people who are are troublemakers that good thing we don't have them around anymore. Well, I, I would have hoped that the president would have sort of upheld in a very strong fashion the need to have these sorts of discussions to try to figure things out like that that's what i would have really hoped would happen uh, and instead we we sort of uh, get this um kind of pandering to the students to, to to like to make and often it's um and you do notice this with some administrators they want they want the students approval uh so and and it's not that's not what you should be doing like that's not your job is to have the students like you and to approve of you you are supposed to be a leader an academic leader and often students don't like things which will assist them become a a, a more a clearer thinker a harder worker a more diligent intellectually minded uh human being because that's hard work and you know there's going to be students who resist that so you know we need leadership in the universities and instead we get people who want to succeed uh, and get promoted and all these sorts of things and unfortunately popularity is often in this day and age what does it and and that's kind of very very disturbing when that starts to happen and i'm not trying to say this is something particular to david doherty i don't think so in fact i think it is a common situation amongst many university pr presidents and it's the rarity it, the, it's actually rare to find um a president who would stand up against this kind of pressure from students so that's not to, to blame or to see anything particular about him personally it's more 
we have this one tape, uh, which is an, a kind of a bit of a window into what goes on. And it's highly likely that this kind of thing is happening all across the country. And if we just go by what happened at Lethbridge, which was a shocking situation where the president who is supposed to be upholding academic freedom caves to this group of activists and violates Paul Viminitz's academic freedom. People still don't understand that's the issue here, is that Paul Viminitz, as a faculty member at the University of Lethbridge, invited someone who he thought had expertise, as and this is kind of his, his whole area of job, you, you know, what, what he's involved with, um, to come and speak in a room, access to faculty, to university resources, to the public, the faculty, the students about this problem of wokeism and how wokeism threatens academic freedom, the president canceled that talk, violated Paul Viminitz's academic freedom, and even worse, the University of Lethbridge Faculty Association, instead of defending Viminitz and protesting that, went on this long, idiotic statement about how hurtful speech, there was this problem of hurtful speech, and there was a need to protect students and faculty from this hurtful speech. So, so that's another huge problem is the faculty associations all across the country have been captured by this activism. So what we're seeing is that all these kinds of entities that are supposed to be protecting the university's academic mandate are now um, you know, disintegrating and we are now going to have the mob is going to decide what's going to happen in universities. And, and it's a very frightening kind of future that we are going to be looking at. Yeah. From watching all those tapes at Lethbridge, I, I find the funny thing about the situation is that you can just tell by the students' faces that they're having a good time of what they're doing. Is that there's never there's never this idea that they're actively there's like there's like this actual Nazi showing up to campus who's like in full regalia and they're like, he's hateful. He has this big mob of people coming. We're here to stop. No, they're having, it's like a party atmosphere. It, it's, it, and the thing is that that it is like actively in my mind, anti-intellectual because they, they celebrate not knowing what you actually believe. I had someone on Twitter that was celebrating the, can the talk being canceled. It was a student from uh, U of A. And at one point I was like, well, did you ever actually read anything she's written, see any tapes from her classes, you know, watch any interviews with her? And he said, no, I haven't. And thank God for that. <laughs> I'm like, that what? <laughs> like the, this person who's like literally fancying themselves at like the forefront of social media, anti-Francis widows and activism is proud that they don't know what you believe. And that, and the, again, because of cognitive dissonance, that person doesn't realize like they they somehow believe that you are absolutely a somehow a hateful anti-indigenous monster yet they also they also know that they've never actually seen anything it, it's so strange how this person almost even feels more virtuous about the fact that they've never seen anything that they they are they are proud of their ignorance on the subject matter as if certain ideas are actually poisonous and even consuming or debating them would have hurt them and that's really the whole sort of like words as violence and kind of oh uh, francis is a stochastic what is that how do you pronounce that so stochastic stochastic terrorist or whatever uh oh, yes. yeah stuff yeah. like that where it's like oh the ideas themselves are somehow like <laughs> are somehow an act of uh, evil and violence and so then, I forget what that means again. Stochastic. What does that mean again? I've heard it before, but I forget. I, I have to go actually look up. I generally know what it is. I still want to get the definition wrong now. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it, it's, yeah. It, it's like, uh, I, I've heard it mentioned the context of um, restrictions on freedom of expression. Epistemic terrorist. Yeah, epistemic terrorist. I know that because I've been accused of that, which is basically that you deny uh these the oppressed ways of knowing right so you you in, inspire terror in your you know delegitimization of these ways of knowing which are based upon you know spiritual beliefs and so on and by not recognizing it you are uh you know denying the humanity of members of oppressed groups and so on yeah, okay, so that's that's what I meant to say. Actually, when I just looked up stochastic terrorists, actually more so applies to your opponents of people who are trying to create terror 
by political demagoguery and uh, and and mania and okay. hysteria. Well, epistemic terrorism that is definitely, and I find that hilarious. Like that's kind of what got me into a little bit of trouble is that I I just can't take that seriously these kinds of accusations because. If you were to sort of write a paragraph on what that meant, it would be absurd. So the fact that this is someone is accepting this and thinking this is an important criticism or whatever um, is 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 kind of funny. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I think Wyatt, we have reached the hour point, so we are kind of getting into some of these uh, uh, kind of subjects which have to do with me, which is fine because there's a, obviously an overlap. But maybe we'll. we'll stop my questioning now and let you start your questioning process. Yeah, so I think I think an interesting jumping off point is just that throughout your sort of entire academic career, both uh, at Mount Royal, did you ever notice a change over the tiers of a, a difference in the student behavior and a student willingness to actually engage with intellectual debates and sort of new ideas? Or was it something that was always a little bit present or was there a, cert a certain year that it really kind of jumped off. Yes, I did. Um, it, it's always been there. And I was actually very surprised. And um, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts in 2008, when I was hired in a couple of years when I was going through the tenure process, um, I did get occasional comments on my student evaluations, very, very few. And the Dean, who is Emmanuel Merton, who was a great Dean and, a, and an academically minded Dean, um, you know, said to me at the time, well, I was actually expecting quite a lot more of that because of all the publicity and everything surrounding disrobing the Aboriginal industry and so on. Um, so very rarely would I get, you know, sort of a comment about my, you know, uh, bigoted views or whatever, but, but that was very, very rare. And um, then starting in and i could sense it because actually it's kind of funny because i used to do this guest lecture for colleagues in the policy studies 5010 class which is the capstone class on uh, topics and policy studies i used to be invited in to do a lecture on diversity policy diversity inclusion and equity policies at the university and i did this i think in 2016 2017 2018, those years. And the first time I did it, or maybe even the first two times, it was a very kind of interested reception that I would be given. And people would be, most of people would be very interested in my critique of diversity policies and so on. And then I think it was in 2018, which was the last time I did it, I there was hostility. <laughs> there was noted hostility from people and you know, they would ask things like like these kind of questions, which I get now, which are just totally misunderstanding my position. Which are you know, are you denying that the residential schools existed, or you know these kinds of things? So so 2018, I, I it was really really bad in 2018, but I think things started to go off the rails um, in a very uh, concerted fashion in 2016 with the indigenization strategy. So indigenization, indigenous strategic plan 2016. Um, and I think Bruce Gilley, who's a, uh, an academic in the States associated with the National Association of Scholars, I believe it was him who mentioned in some talk that the plan was to get rid of Francis Whittleson, 2016, 2021, yeah. And then 2021, I'm fired. So now the plan has achieved uh, its objectives. Um, and that's a little bit facetious, but the, the 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 meaning though is is still taken, which is when you have it as the official university position that you should quote unquote foster respect for indigenous ways of knowing, you you put faculty members who are critical of that position in a very, very difficult position. And that's what happened to me. And you know, we had um you know, people, and I'll, I'll mention his name because he's no longer at Mount Royal, people like Noah Arney, who comes up now and again as a critic of, of mine, he would be, in, he, he publicly encouraged students who were saying that I should, if I didn't like indigenization, I should leave Mount Royal, you know, this sort of thing. When it's my duty as an academic 
to criticize things which I think are going to harm the academic mandate of the university. Like that, that's my duty. And I, I was encouraged to do this my entire academic career. And now we have a scenario where I'm being told, you know, just shut up. Like, you know, we've heard enough from you when my points are still valid. And based upon what we're seeing at the University of Lethbridge and Mount Royal, you know, this is going to do serious damage to the academic mandate of the university, having these political pronouncements that are putting place. So 2016 was when that happened. Um, but there was all sorts of other forces that were gaining traction. And then 2020, that's when you really saw things, uh, you know, fall apart. It was like a tipping point was reached with the, the killing of George Floyd and all the forces that were amassing saw their chance and moved very, very quickly. Did, did you think that, uh, did you think that that it also, the, just the fact that we were on Zoom schools and nobody was actually at the university all that often, it gave people within the faculty more license to be, uh, to go after you knowing that there wasn't this campus environment to which people notice all of this kind of social revolution happen. It's just kind of, it's kind of hidden behind, you know, the digital way that universities were being, uh, the way that the university was being deli digitally delivered. It's, it's likely, um, I think it speeded things up for sure. People were spending more time on their computer and social media. People were becoming a little bit unbalanced due to not having personal contact. And I think it's always easier to, to communicate with people when you are face to face. Um, well, <laughs> that didn't work at the University of Lathbridge. Well, it did a little bit. Like I had a good conversation with an indigenous man uh, face to face, um, you know. But but on online and and it it makes it easier to be rude, especially if it's you don't see the person's face. Um, but I was on sabbatical that year. Is the other thing. So I wasn't really involved in any kind of the classroom kind of dynamics that were going on. But the social media. People were spending a lot more time on social media, and that's when like people started to go after me on social media. So, so that that played a role in it. But I think what happened was inevitable, just based upon the the, the kind of developments that were occurring. It just it just got you know kind of compressed. The timeline got compressed. But you know I was being targeted. You know since I got at Mount since I I arrived at Mount Royal, I, I was having these things happen. But it just became kind of the accelerating process that that went on. Yeah, and maybe maybe because it was kind of one of the it was the triggering point with a lot of people was the book the Aboriginal Industry. Maybe I'll just ask a couple a few questions about that. And because I I watched a bunch of your interviews once the book did come out in Sun TV and on TVO and whatnot. I thought that was I I really like Steve Pakin's uh, yeah. interview. I think he's always a very fair man. Uh, yeah. when he does interviews, but w was it from, have you ever actually had someone challenge uh, the thesis of your book that you wrote with Albert uh, Albert Howard in an honest way, or has, has, has it always been the quote mining and the sort of insinuations of a worse motive of, have you ever actually been able to have a real discussion about, because the one, well, the one quote I want to bring up and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the quote they always like to jump on in the Aboriginal industry book is something along the lines, paraphrasing, of course, it's like, well, thank God for residential schools. And the whole point is it's a statement that I read, and maybe you can again, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's not the exact wording, it's, it's a statement layered with irony and, and satire about the fact that we are so uh, terrified of the legacy of residential schools. We don't even teach Indigenous children properly on reserves. So the whole point is, no matter how bad residential schools were, and they were, is it, it's sort of sad that that was still, in a certain sense, the better education system in just the curriculum sense. Yeah, so um, I, 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 Albert Howard and I, when we were writing about the residential schools, this was, I guess we must have been doing it in 2005. And at the time, we, and I remember the words that we put, put in there, I thought it was a hysterical claim that genocide, that the residential schools were genocidal. So it's kind of amusing looking at that now, because now if you don't say that they're genocidal, then you're going to be told you're a hate monger and things like that, which I don't even every, every Every child's body not found is just more evidence that there must be more bodies out there. Yeah. Uh, so 
and and the residential schools just a, there's just a few pages um and i don't i don't think there was ever any kind of statement thank god for the residential schools or anything like that but it was again not denying the harm so people who say i think the residential schools were a good idea or what that that's never been said the residential schools had terrible harms uh, due to um, a lot of it was insensitivity and not recognizing the difficulties Indigenous peoples were facing. Um, but there was also lack of funding and like offloading it onto the churches and um, zero oversight and stuff like that. You know, the, but like at the same time, it was scarce resources all around. People were making decisions without all the information. And a, a study was done called the Davin Report, which looked at boarding schools in the United States and found that boarding schools had better outcomes than non-boarding school situations because of the nomadic uh, kind of character of indigenous groups. And the children would go away for months at a time and then come back and forget everything that had been learned. So you had sparsely populated um, you know, nomadic groups and there had to be some way to impose, put in place the structures that would allow pre-literate cultures to read and write and obtain um, not a complete understanding of the world, but certainly a better understanding of the world than what existed in hunting and gathering cultures. And that was not a bad thing, that they learned to read and write. <laughs> and Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about it. If I'm remembering it now, it might have been a quote more of like, at least residential schools provided education. And then it was also an allusion yeah. to, well, that's not a bad motivation to want to provide education. And today we we almost try not providing education. As, and we when we fill uh, schools on reserves with a lot of ancillary uh, subject matters that Indigenous yeah. kids don't need to know. And it's actually just wasting <laughs> their time and not focusing on the sort of the reading writing and arithmetic sort of a thing but that that but yeah maybe getting back to more of like the did you ever actually have someone really argue the thesis of the book or was it always this you were insensitive you didn't uh, engage with the indigenous community enough when you were writing it sort of stuff um there's been varying degrees like most of it is just you know the Negan Sinclair Sean Carlton and Keisha Supernant approach which is to just call you a denier which of course is uh, making some kind of comparison to Holocaust denial, which I find to be, well, at the, when I first started hearing it, I thought it was hilarious because like Kamloops residential school where we have anomalies of the ground penetrating radar, where there were septic tiles put in like in 1927 and, and whatever, and, and there's all sorts of excavations. And <clears throat> that's the only evidence that we have which is highly unlikely to be these clandestine burials. And if you look at like the whole, all the evidence for Kamloops in Indian residential school, like there were concerted efforts to uh, enable children to integrate, to provide them with activities. There was even a, even a swimming pool there and so on. Um, it was obviously not Auschwitz. This is ridiculous for people to be making a comparison between the Kamloops Indian Residential School and Auschwitz. Like people need to give their heads a shake about this. Um, so th this is kind of the problem is that because of Carlton Sinclair and Supernance um, sort of dismissal and, and castigation of anyone who wants to kind of have a, a more fulsome discussion, all the kinds of difficulties that the residential schools face, as well as the current difficulties, this is the most important point, it is extremely difficult to provide education to these isolated indigenous communities. Very, very difficult. And that needs serious attention. But because of all this kind of noise, we can never get to that discussion. And, and that's kind of the biggest tragedy is that we need to look at the residential schools to see what they did right and what they did wrong. <laughs> they did uh, some I, I, things right. <laughs> no, it wasn't genocide. It was yeah. trying to deal with huge difficulties and being insensitive in many ways, not, you know, separating children from their parents, which has had long lasting problems, et cetera. Um, not 
um, kind of trying to move the culture along with you. Like once you start to to really be coercive with things, you you will provoke a reaction, and that is now we're leave, living with that legacy to this day of mistrust and everything in Indigenous communities. So um, this needs like very very um, you know critical analysis, a lot of critical analysis. But we we can't get everyone's so afraid just to you know step on the wrong you know thing and get get a huge backlash that everyone's now just kind of silent about it all. And in the meantime, the terrible conditions in these isolated indigenous communities continue. And we now have probably fetal alcohol syndrome rates somewhere in the area of about 40% in many of these communities. This is like gonna be a, a long lasting tragedy that you know, we need to think about, we need to figure out how to improve things, but that's that's just not possible right now, unfortunately, with all this kind of um, sort of, the, 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 the academic uh, people who are commenting on it, just, you know, attacking anyone who disagrees with them. Yeah, so there wasn't, there wasn't really all that much good intellectual debate over it. It was very much like people are maybe even scared to even, even if they want to have an honest debate, they were scared to actually engage in it, honestly. Yeah, so it wasn't very developed. Um, there was a few good, like, for example, uh, Robert McGee, who was an archaeologist at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, he wrote quite a good piece in uh, the Literary Review of Canada, I think it is uh, called, in a sense, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of an intellectual publication. Um, and I did have some exchanges with uh, Robert McGee about it. That was very, very good. There was a few other kinds of attempts, you know, but it just, um, it, it never got like, like we needed to have ongoing kind of forums set up to, to get at the points and to figure out what the points of disagreement were. And, and it became progressively worse. So it started off in 2008, there was a few openings, but of course you only have so much time. So, you know, I didn't, wasn't able to, Albert and I weren't able to devote enough time to it. And it never, and no one ever took it up again. Like it never, it never became like a ongoing exchange. Um, maybe now with the, this quote unquote, what they call the unmarked grave situation, that seems to me to be the area of the most hope to move this forward because the Kamloops case is so obviously you know, a, a misguided effort to, you know, sort of accept whatever Indigenous people say as being true, when it's obviously uh, got serious problems with that hypothesis, and no one wants to kind of pursue it. We're, we're almost in like a Salem witch trial kind of a uh, kind of, no, of course, it's not like no one's being specifically accused. Well, we have this weird Salem witch trial kind of culture around the Kamloops case, where it's like in the Salem trials you had like legitimately people using spectral evidence that i just know that this has yeah. somehow happened or i saw something in a dream like we're having stuff that, that that's that vague being proposed as evidence that uh, and, and usually excuses of why we also shouldn't excavate any of this stuff to prove whether or not there, there's actually bodies especially bodies that would that would um show signs of actual abuse but it's it's the funny thing is that the people who are most on about this and trying to say it's genocide and there's evidence of it and there's well, there's mass graves of tens of thousands of people it, it almost becomes like hardcore anti-vaxxers and i've <laughs> interacted with many of these people who you'll talk to them and oh no 17 of my close family members died of the vaccine and it's like it, every single one of them claims 25 people they know personally died and if you ever talk to them and say well what, what evidence do you have? They're like, well, I'm just trying to raise awareness. And the thing is, I guarantee if you follow any of these threads of people saying, oh, yeah, I saw this abuse and they're the horror stories are obviously fictitious. It's obviously something that someone would have talked about before the year 2022 if it yeah. was real. And yeah. yet they and but the thing is that there's just more and more crazy stories and then that person runs away and you'll never see them again. And this is what I always find whenever I'm having to interact with hardcore anti-vaxxers who want you to take the their story seriously or why aren't you printing news on this and then you'll find out that so many of them are just ado adopting a narrative that's out there in the world because they think it's somehow important to 
uphold it. So you'll get people who went to a residential school or quote unquote residential school in like the 1980s. Like we're clearly far past uh, residential schools of the 1880s type of quality, the 1910s. And this person is pretending that they grew up in like, you know, they they grew up in the clink. It's it's insane. Like they grew up in medieval England. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, this this is known as hysteria. So the the Salem Witch Trials was a well-known case of hysteria. There's been other, uh, the satanic panic, actually. My colleague, Kirsten Kramer, uh, uh, alerted me to this uh, situation, which I was aware of, but I hadn't studied it in any detail. The, the satanic panic in the in the 80s and the 90s where a lot of people got put in jail for satanic abuse which turned out not <laughs> it didn't happen but i don't it's and it's a curious thing as to why people are you know drawn to believe things that are obviously untrue uh and so this stuff at the Kamloops case has got and that's what i wrote in my piece billy remembers i I draw parallels with the satanic panic. And um, this is just, and people are getting swept up in it. And, and and again, it's not people lying. So people should be aware of that, is that when people are saying these stories, it's not because they're lying. Memory is a very tricky thing. And if you are, you know, you've got some emotional problems of yourself, you're not, you know, really interrogating your own memory very much you can get swept up into a very emotional kind of frame of mind where you start to believe things and justify things in your head. And there's this minister whose name is Kevin Annette, who has has been involved in this area now uh, for, for, for a number of decades. He was involved in these kinds of healing circles with people on um, the, the east side of Vancouver. And, and there's a whole bunch of like, obviously kind of stories which are just being imagined and and that's what that's kind of what we have to start thinking critically a little bit with respect to the Kamloops case. The most disturbing thing about the Kamloops case was the actions of the CBC program, The Fifth Estate, which aired, I believe, in January 2021. Or no, so I guess it must have been, yeah. 22, because I think this all happened, the whole massive yes. thing was a 2021 yeah, January summer 2020. event. Yeah. Anyway, The Fifth Estate, which used to be the flagship investigative journalism program for CBC, had Jillian Findlay, a seasoned investigative journalist, sitting there just taking it all in. These stories with no questioning, no nothing, just, you know, things like a woman, she claims. So so we had all these stories. First of all, you're correct. There was a book that was written in either the 90s or 2000 called Be- Be- Behind Closed Doors, which had testimonies of people. And no one mentioned any of this. these people being buried in the apple orchard. There was a reference to the furnace, but it was a, it was a third-hand account. It wasn't a first-hand account because there used to be these stories about things happening with the furnace, but no one saw anything or anything. But then when the Kamloops... Uh, quote unquote discovery came to light, all these people came out of the woodwork and started having these these stories that they were they were recounting. Anyway, Julie Jillian Finley just sit there and listen to all these stories. One of them was a woman who says that she was uh walking back from class and turned to look at this barn and there was four boys hanging from the bar from the barn. So if you're Jilly, if you are an investigative journalist, you don't just go, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> it's well, who were these boys, and and who was the principal at the time, and were there any records of you know four boys who were there, and then they didn't come back from lunch or what? Like these, all these kinds of questions, but that just went completely, you know, just accept into an area of an acceptance. So there's been a massive failure by the media. Uh, with respect to this issue, and not all of it is their fault, because um, when the first announcement was made by the band, there was a carefully orchestrated attempt to control information about things. So um, the report 
by Sarah Bullyu, who did the GPR, has never been released. They had these press conferences where you weren't allowed to have any follow-up questions or anything. They had a Zoom kind of press conference when only kind of supportive journalists were invited. And, you know, so, so like the band was very conscious at having this kind of narrative being put forward. And then the AFN had this as part of its um, kind of resolutions and everything that it put forward as well. So it is a part of this neo-tribal renterism uh, phenomenon where you ex extract transfers on the basis of harm that has occurred. And if you can exaggerate the harm, you can exaggerate the transfers. And that's what Indigenous politics has been about for the last 40, 50 years. And this is not having any beneficial effects on Indigenous communities and is in fact worsening them in many of the isolated areas and is causing a great deal of anger and resentment, which is not based upon anything real. Uh, and so this needs serious attention. And hopefully we are beginning to see a little bit of critical analysis coming out of the media. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. I'll say this just, just before I move on to the next question. I think it was important to say, even though the people making these stories that are clearly just unbelievable, like the, the chances that they happened are like just nothing. But it's important to mention the fact that they aren't lying. A lot of these people are not lying. They yeah. truly believe that this happened just yeah. because of the social environment that they are in, yeah. that they can, if you ask them a few questions, they would be they would acknowledge that they, that wasn't true. At the same time, emotionally, in a certain back their head sense, it feels true based on the way that people are behaving. That you can sort of that again. It, it's I, I keep going back to this. People don't understand how powerful cognitive dissonance is. Something can be so clearly wrong, and yet the person believes that it's completely right, while also in the back of their head ha knowing that there is a gap in what they actually know or knowing that there is a actual untruth to what they're saying. People can think that they're both lying and telling the truth at the same time. It's, it's quite remarkable when you run into it in a particularly acute case. But uh, maybe going back to more of the university as a subject matter, uh, but also still tying it to the Aboriginal industry book, would you say, uh, and I'll use Mount Royal as a uh, example here, that in, in the sort of Aboriginal industry framework that you and Albert Howard had kind of described, that certain things in the university like indigenization, but in particular things like the Aniscom Center have become part of the Aboriginal industry. It's very much that you don't, that Aboriginal people on reserves aren't just brought into the sort of uh, industry of sort of, uh, I don't know, you, you turning grievances into ways of getting government transfers, but also in, ensuring that Indigenous students that go to universities go into activist type studies, Indigenous studies, because I know two different Indigenous people from Mount Royal University who had complained to me saying that they found it very insulting when the university kept implying that they should do Indigenous studies when they want to do computer science or business, that there was very much this pipeline that they wanted to keep you almost not that it's intentional, like someone has a grand plan to do this, but there is this sort of idea that you're Indigenous, you should be in uh you should be focused on all things indigenous and reserve politics is very much your area of expertise which is one of those things i've always found oddly racist that this person has the genetics that makes them that they should be studying this particular thing and not gaining a skill in something that's very hands-on and practical yeah like, like like a lot of university things that go on at universities are about diverting funds from one area of the university to other areas of the university so it has that kind of rent seeking kind of character and the indigenous kind of identity is one of the things that is used as the basis for extracting money one way or another. And, and that happened with indigenous studies. Right. And we saw that. So, um, you know, all, and, and a lot of these accusations of racism and everything are efforts at that. So if you say, there's this terrible racism that is just permeating Mount Royal, which no one seems to be able to specify. Um, and the administration says, oh, yes, 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 this is a terrible problem. We have to combat this. Let's divert funds from the sciences and, you know, the academic arts programs into Indigenous studies and we'll hire Indigenous professors and we'll 
move more money into the Inescom Center to do this. That you know, this is part of this uh, rent-seeking neo-tribal renterism kind of activity. As well, you have the work that is done in those areas in, in Indigenous studies as justifying the neo-tribal renterism. So it, it's got a kind of a double whammy because on the one hand, it extracts funding for activists instead of having funding for improving the academic character of the institution. And secondly, the people who are self-selected and also um, selected by the system to go into those areas are activists. And then the kind of research that they do supports uh, the kind of, you know, uh, activities that are going on in, in the Inniskim Center and the and the Indigenous Studies Program. The Inniskim Center started out as a very, very good idea. And, and this is kind of the problem with it, you know, talking about indigenization. People say, oh, you're against indigenization. Well, I'm not against all kinds of proposals that have been put forward. I'm very, very supportive of any attempt to improve the educational levels of Indigenous students. And we do understand that it's difficult for Indigenous students who are coming from isolated communities, living in areas where they don't know very many uh, non-Indigenous people. It's a very alienating experience to come to the university. So in, in that sense, the Inniskim Center did very, very good work because it kind of provided assistance in allowing that transition from the isolated communities to the you know modern society to occur. So, so that was where things were beneficial. When things started to go awry was when there was a justification of the low educational levels that started to occur. So instead of working to improve educational levels, we would say, no, 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 the problem is, is that indigenous people don't have any access to what they call quote unquote indigenous science. And indigenous science, you know, is based on like that idea, which it shouldn't even be called indigenous science because it's not, well, this is very, I used to think you would be able to argue that indigenous science is not science oh. in the university, but you get slammed with harassment charges if you make that claim. This is how bad it is. Um, but when you put an indigenous ad adjective in front of um, science, it, it means it's not, it's an eth, got an ethnic character and it's not science anymore because science is a universal that can be accessed by anyone. Um, so that was a kind of problem. So indigenous people have a, have a difficult, many, many, not all, but many have a difficult time succeeding in the academic kind of realm. Instead of working to improve their educational levels, we justify their low educational levels by saying, no, no, they just have a different way of knowing. You know, so yeah. like we'll just keep them where they are. And that that is a really, really, you know, terrible thing that's happening. And that's generally what the focus has been in universities now, yeah. I guess starting from about five years ago. Which again, what well, the funny thing is I think you'd be one of the few people who would not I think a lot of people know this in their head, but they just want to speak up. But you'd be one of the few people who would actually say, Isn't that kind of borderline insulting to say that this person does not actually engage in the scientific method of, of sort of like understanding issues or they don't work on they don't work based on logic they work based on something else and the thing is that the way that i've always had indigenous ways of knowing described to me is it's actually a, a very cross-cultural uh way of quote-unquote way of knowing uh that it's it's everywhere it's actually not even unique to indigenous people it's just called what you'd say like i guess in this case, I'd, I'd say academic in front of it, but it's Gnosticism. It's just academic Gnosticism, that if you engage enough in traditional ways, then you know more about a particular subject. It's like the example, actually, I think you used during your one of your, the night before your Lethbridge talk, that if, if uh, Indigenous hunters say, well, there's more bears this year because we've seen more bears. It's like, yeah, that's, there, there's, maybe some, uh, there's maybe some validity to that, but it's not quite right. But where you get a lot of people saying is that well this person lives in the environment it's very it's very much like trying to treat native people like they're like uh they're caricatures of uh of uh of, of primitive cultures but they're like that they because they live in the environment and they're more connected to it they know more about it because they through and it's like again it's a fairly racist argument because they're acting like it's part of their blood that allows them to take in knowledge it's like they bring in knowledge 
through uh, <laughs> through their skin. It's very strange the way that they do this. That it's 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 lowering it's lowering expectations, and it's actually kind of it, there, the implication is too is that if there was a native mathematician who is very good at what he does, we would care less about that than the person who te- teaches you about traditional medicine. That mm-hmm. like it, that the implication is actually there because it, it, throughout all of indigenization. I've never had them mention, oh, here's a native Canadian who made this innovation in science. They would never bring that up because it's not it's not part of the indigenization narrative. But I just want to bring up this, too, because I remember these signs all over uh, Mount Royal. And you'll remember that I just want to bring it up on screen is all of these <laughs> sorts of things. I'll just read it. I'm showing that this is a, this is a real one I'm uh, mentioning. It's that it says if you think and of course, they don't use capital letters on, other than if it's Aboriginal people. Uh, so it says if you think Aboriginal people had no medical knowledge, then you have a colonized mind, which is an, a hilarious statement because nobody had basically any medical knowledge worth anything until like 1890. It, it's such a strange uh, perspective to take that if I somehow have this parody straw man position that I think that they didn't know anything about medicine to the point where they had no medicine, then like no one believes that it's arguing against nobody, but the the actual deeper implication about those decolonized signs all over Mount Royal is that you have to think that they had advanced medicine or somehow you're being derogatory because the, the only thing that they would ever talk about medicine was how, how intelligent it was despite the fact that most people's medicine didn't really work and people are kind of working on like half truths about how uh, medical, uh, about how remedies work and whatnot. It was a time when you didn't really have, you know, medication. You had like apothecary remedies in Europe. And, but no one would go back and say, well, you have like an anti-Western mind because you don't think that, you know, people throwing on masks full of, uh, <laughs> full of cloves and whatnot and rubbing salve <laughs> uh, or rubbing dirt on people's, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, b- like black death pustules, then you're somehow like anti-Western. Like no one would say that. If what the, what they were doing was probably made sense at the time, and there's probably some small forms of uh, of intelligence that went into coming to those wrong conclusions. But the vast majority of medical knowledge was just wrong for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so in terms of the uh, my last, so I gave on. In Lethbridge, um, although Paul Viminitz's academic freedom was violated when he asked me to speak on how wokeism threatens academic freedom, that's the big issue. So people are losing uh, kind of uh, focus on the main issue, which still needs to be recognized and dealt with by the University of Lethbridge Faculty Association. Um, I was able to give two ta- two lectures, guest lectures in Paul Viminitz's philosophy class, which was on the question of should uh, universities foster respect, which is the language from Indigenous Strategic Plan for Indigenous Ways of Knowing. And in this, I went through, uh, and it's difficult because um, you you have lots of different people talking about Indigenous Ways of Knowing. So it's like, which kind of definition or whatever are you going to accept? And what you tend to do is just kind of pull out the one that you find is most useful and coherent to talk about. And in my case, the most useful and coherent overview of this was done by Marlene Brandt Castellano, who is a Mohawk person who was um, uh, the research director for the, for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. So someone who was, you know, well-respected in both in the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community, which allowed her to have that position anyway she says that there and i understand from what i understand ways of knowing are what enables you to obtain knowledge so these ways whatever they are result in knowledge and according to brent castellano there's basically three ways um empirical observations revelation and traditional teaching so those are the three quote unquote ways, according to her. Now, there could be other things and so on, but that seemed to me to be a very concise way of looking at it. And um, the, the empirical observations is, is often what's called local knowledge. So it's not an indigenous thing at all. It's just knowledge that you get as the polar bear example uh, from you know living in close contact and seeing animals all the time and so on. Um, and then we got to do a big discussion of this in class because 
uh, it, it works as far as it does in terms of local activities, but when you try to make a population-wide type of statement, like how many polar bears there actually are, you can't do it with local knowledge because you don't have a systematic approach that allows that to be understood. And this is a big conflict in the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, because scientists do population counts and the elders are saying, no, those are wrong because we're seeing more bears this year. But just because you see more bears in a location doesn't mean that the polar bear numbers in general are increasing because there just could be movement of bears from one location to another, et cetera. Um, this second one, revelation, is not a way of knowing at all. Uh, it is a kind of a uh, appealing to the supernatural to help you to reach some conclusion, but that there's no evidence for that at all. So that's a complete that's a belief system and so on, which people are entitled to have, but it's not a way of knowing. Third one, traditional teachings. Um, some of this can be helpful in understanding, like some of our traditional teachings are valid. Um, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning, et cetera, whatever. It may be folk knowledge and traditional explanations. Some of them, however, are wrong. And we have to have some kind of method to be able to determine which traditional teachings are right and which tradi traditional teachings are wrong. So, so that's kind of like my take on that subject. With respect to those posters that you're talking about, this is absolute educational malpractice. And I would say like people are talking about harassment. When you're harassed, I find them to be harassing because they are telling you that you must accept a view even when reason, evidence, and logic is, is telling you that that's not the case. And the medicine example is, is very uh, you know, on point, which you're talking about, is that there's been progress in medicinal knowledge over time. You know, something, and it's sort of a gradual process, but it wasn't really until the scientific method was employed that we, we came to a a much better understanding of, of medicine. Hunting and gatherers, their knowledge of medicine was very, very uh, sparse. And we would never want to go back to medicine men and witch doctors and whatever to, to cure our ailments. The worst poster, however, was the one on Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you remember that one. I, I, I've seen a lot of them. I don't remember the exact text of the Christopher Which Columbus was one. just totally like, it's not a, this is not a fact at all. Uh, that Christopher, did you know that Christopher Columbus encountered indigenous people in uh, Ireland before he made his trip to the Americas? There's no evidence of that at all. What is this indigenization office talking about? And surely you should be able to contest that. Um, anyway, I find that was like shocking. That the, the amount of misinformation around Christopher Columbus is insane. There's actually a fantastic <laughs> video people should watch from the channel Knowing Better on myths about Christopher Columbus. And although he was weak kneed enough, he made a follow-up video just saying, well, I'm not saying Christopher Columbus is a good guy. I'm just saying that he's, he's an extremely exaggerated uh, evil in the sense that people are like, he's genocide. He was literally locked up at one point because he was refusing to uh, to punish indigenous people for not mining gold. He was like, it was kind of funny because he was actually punished for punching sailors for abusing indigenous people. And this is literally in original or like uh, transcripts of diaries that they have. Yeah, he's like still blamed. Everything, every single bad thing in North America is still blamed on the man. Um, and there's a lot of myths like, no, he didn't think he had hit India. He thought he hit an island off of the coast of Japan because they didn't know where Japan ended and stuff like that. Uh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But it's just like, but like, yeah, like all these posters, it's just rand. It's it's like basically the the version of of a Big Brother poster just pointing at you and saying you're wrong on a subject. You're like we're watching you. If you if you voice any opinion differing from one of these posters, you could you know find yourself in uh, some sort of like an academic uh, probation. Like if you were to say that, to, you know, like well, it's, again, wokeism. We got to keep in mind wokeism, which is it's perfectly fine for an indigenous activist to bully a non-indigenous person that's fine but if you stand up to that bullying and you're non-indigenous then you're a harasser like this is kind of the, the logic that's going on with wokeism um, but i found that to be 
incredible that a university would be so openly anti-intellectual and, um, you know, like we have in our collective agreement that you're supposed to be tolerant of different points of view <laughs> and intolerant of any dissent, you know, like it's, it's it, and this just kind of shows you where we're going uh, with this, but, but this is, you know, indigenization, you know, moving forward, taking up more and more space, making the ability to criticize and to um, express, you know, rational points of view more and more difficult in an attempt to extract funds from other areas of the university, to drain funding from other areas of the university, which are actually doing academically uh, valuable work within the university context. Well, the thing is too, that what you end up getting is that what it's not just something that you can avoid on campus where if you don't agree with the ideas you're not allowed to criticize them but it's completely voluntary whether you engage with them or not that's the problem with indigenization is it's it's uh, it's baking into the university that these are things that you, at some point and i could see that happening in the next few years you must verbally affirm or you're not going to be able to get your degree because i think that you've talked about that they were almost like not that i'm i assume that you didn't have to show up to them but it's not that just these are uh, these are values that we share like they've effectively turned the aniscom center into like the judiciary of the school where it, they can kind of act on uh, uh, the act by themselves and if they say something then it's a ruling that might change a bunch of uh a bunch of like university policy but you were talking about the fact that they would just bring in uh for indigenization initiatives faculty to come here indigenous speakers and it would be like actual pseudoscience where you'd have like an indigenous man talking to doctors and saying well how do you how do you cure a child uh like like uh a, a, like a, a what what was it like a, some sort of a stomach cancer stomach or some sort of do, a different stomach illnesses and it's like well you rub, rub a corn poultice on a child's like the underside of a child's foot and it's like this is one, it's just insulting to bring this person in here, knowing that it's going to be in a room full of people where even if no one says anything, and this is where I find that it's actually, it's actually kind of sad that everyone in this room is saying this man's a fool in, in their head. Every single one, no matter how much respectful stuff that they say verbally, every single person is thinking in their head, this man's a fool, and I'm not going to talk to him ever again. That, but there, he's effectively being brought in as some sort of a show. Uh, well, well, there's two kinds of things that go on. One is is that, um, and this person uh, was brought in by Renee Watchman, uh, who I can talk about because Renee Watchman is no longer at Mount Royal University. Um, and she brought him in honestly as as someone she thought uh, would be uh, have a, have views that would be helpful to the university. So, and that's fine. She's she has the academic freedom to do that. The difficulty was, is that the people in the room, the scientists in the room, felt that they, they, they were appalled by it, by, 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 by the, the kind of advice that was being given, which was not uh, scientifically valid and was just, you know, the elder's opinion, which he's entitled to have. Um, but it shouldn't be, um, it, you should be, feel free to contest that view when you're there. But they thought it was appalling, but they did they just sat down with their heads head down and didn't do anything because they knew that um this would be unwelcome to do that, right? Like it's kind of known. And and in fact, uh, my actions that day um were seen by Renee Watchman to be harassing, right? And she's made all these complaints about me because she thinks that my criticism of indigenization is harassing, and that is not her fault that she thinks that. Um, it is Mount Royal University's fault because Mount Royal University is not signaling that you should be able to critically analyze all views at a university. Like that is important, very, very important now. Is we, if we're going to be a university, we shouldn't feel this kind of, oh, this is a kind of a forbidden zone. This is a ring fenced kind of idea here. You know, we should just be quiet because that is going to corrode the intellectual character of the university if we have that. And we really need administrators, faculty associations, probably faculty associations the most important because administrators are notoriously fickle. 
Um, but faculty associations are the representatives of faculty, and they're the ones supposed to be holding the line uh, on academic freedom and open inquiry, and they are completely captured by wokeism. And University of Lethbridge Faculty Association, oh, what they did is just shameful. And I've been talking about this a lot because I think that's kind of like the the the, the, the what should be focused on. And I've noticed a lot of other faculty associations doing that as well. Mount Royal Faculty Association, serious problems there. Um, you know, they are at least taking my case to arbitration and have Canadian Association of University Teachers involved in defending me. Um, and CAUT is much more um, stronger, much stronger on this file because they're like, they see the national picture. And if I go down, universities are over. Uh, this yeah, is that's where people don't understand that the minority of professors are like against Francis Widowson and I can't believe mm -hmm. Francis Widowson can be on campus. But, like, do you think the business professors at Mount Royal, and I, I know what generally the opinion is of business professors, they don't like this at all because they understand that undermining the concept of tenure is a very dangerous thing. You don't turn tenure into something where, yes, you have a guaranteed job unless you violate a vague code of conduct that's ever shifting. That's the, that's the problem too, is that also half the charges they have against you not only are they completely wrong but they're like very old it's kind of like the colin may situation in alberta when he was fired as the alberta human rights commissioner he wrote in a review of a book about islam where he basically just uh he just emphasized or he just like uh viewed the guy's arguments and then talked about the quality of the argument and what it was and how he how the writing was and that was a book review from like 2007 that wasn't even online and someone found it and because they it wasn't online they could hide what the text was and they could just say that it was very bigoted and islamophobic and if colin may wants the job then he has to go and you know grovel to the nccm which is not an organization it's the national council of Canadian muslims which is not an which is not a uh, organization that has any right to be casting aspersions at someone like colin may yeah and uh, well um, i have 30 professors who will put their names behind me uh and there's a lot more who would support me but they are you know they're nervous about their own positions and so on so i have a lot of support at mount royal university i'm hoping this is going to come out in the arbitration process um the people who are opposed to me are either uh the true believers uh and and, and you know to some extent i have respect for those people because that's you know they think i'm harming students and i think you know these sorts of things i think they're misguided but i think they're honest the worst are the opportunistic people the people who don't really care one way or the other they're just going to do whatever they think is going to benefit them in terms of their careers and those people are the dangerous ones who are doing things like that and I know a number of those people, and uh, they are going to destroy the university. You know, I can, the woke people, you know, I, I think there might be some hope there with some of them to, you know, open things up. But with the, the Machia, what Jordan Peterson calls the Machiavellians, uh, they are impossible because they are not standing on any principles and they are just I, going to side with whatever thing. I, I saw a lot of, I, I saw a lot of that and, where right after you were initially fired, a lot of these people who, who I knew would never say a thing about it. Suddenly they're coming out and then, and then backing the movement, even though they were not the ones who, and at least I, I would agree, at least with the true believers, they put in the real work of opposing you. A lot of these people are just tagging along and pretending and trying to take on all the social points, knowing that, they'll probably inherit not only better positions because you're gone, but these woke professors tend to also be the ones who burn themselves out quite quickly and leave academia at one point. It's really hard to be researching what is nonsense uh, all your life. So I always find like with the Watchmans, they eventually move on. Uh, but, uh, but like, oh, and maybe here's a good, this is a good uh, point to maybe start to start to wrap up on is what you're sort of like, because the thing is, I think you've said this in the past, maybe it'd be a good point to reiterate it. If you went back to Mount Royal, they reinstate you. You have no problem with going back to just doing your own research and teaching your classes. Is mm -hmm. that there's sort of this idea that somehow Francis wants to disrupt and get in people's way. When your motivation throughout this entire thing, and I think it's been fairly consistent, is just to go back and teach classes. Yeah, so I have no problem. Um, you know, Mount Royal is trying to make the case that uh, my position is unviable. 
um, because some people don't like me, uh, basically, and some students are upset with my ideas. Um, when, you know, Mount Royal, if it is a university, this, this shouldn't matter to it. The, the most frustrating thing is that um, I, none of the things that I have been accused of um, were to do with on-campus activities at all. So it had nothing to do with the classroom, nothing to do with anything on campus. Um, what occurred is, is that um, an Indigenous activist went after me um, for defending Wendy Mesley's reference to the book title White Niggers of America. And I just um, satirized her efforts to try to get me fired, which then enraged a whole bunch of woke people who wanted to defend her. And, you know, I, I she was the one who went after me. I didn't even go after her. So I, I don't understand why everyone thinks this is such a uh, a terrible thing that I did. I, I, I really think I was quite measured in how I was just trying to, like, and, and as well, I'd been subjected to all sorts of defamation for years, and Mount Royal had given me the signal that this wasn't a workplace matter that they were going to pursue. But then they decided in 2020, because they wanted to defend this Indigenous activist, that they were going to pursue me uh, for my social media activity. So the whole thing has been botched. But I'm perfectly, like, I'm happy just to let things drop. I, I don't really, um, I got some direction about not directing my social media activities at any member of the MRU community. And I was happy to abide by that. I have no, I don't feel I have any scores to settle with anyone. Um, I think that, um, you know, in terms of my questions, which were perceived to be relentless and uh, asked with ill intent, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm only one person and maybe I was taking up too much space with, you know, my questioning. So I'll have to, you know, re. You know, although, although although my my time on GFC, I I would argue that if they actually engaged with the arguments properly and didn't just hum and haw for twenty five minutes at a time, that you would have taken up less time if they actually you know ever ever bothered engaging. I think the good news is that if you're reinstated, uh, because of the performative nature of these people's opposition, I think it's going to be going back uh, like going back to normal fairly quickly. Because at the end of the day, these people can only pretend to really care that you're on campus so long. And eventually, when they know that they can't get rid of you anymore, it's going to settle down a little bit. Every once in a while, there's a symbolic stand against the uh, against the force that is Francis Widowson on campus. But it really, I, I, the good thing is that they don't tend to be all that serious about what they actually believe in a certain sense, just like the uh, people not wanting the cameras turned off and then being perfectly happy to stand in front of them. But uh, I, I actually, I just want to I want to compliment you on the quality of the Francis McGrath Twitter account, because I remember when that was operating. I was actually fooled by it, and I thought it was someone who made a parody account, which still embarrasses me today. I thought yeah. it was someone who was actively, it was such good parody, I thought it was actively someone who didn't understand the McGrath character and was going after you as being a, a systemic terrorist and an uh, evil person who needs to, uh, like, who needs to do a uh, land acknowledgement and repent of her uh, instance yeah. against the, uh, in, against yeah. indigenization. Yeah, well, I, I still, you know, I, I haven't been doing it very much because I'm still like, I think it's sometimes I've done some really good ones. Sometimes I've done some ones that are not very funny, you know, sort of thing. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the essence of it is to get at and Andrew Doyle. It's modeled on Andrew Doyle's character, Titania McGrath. He's much better than me. Like he's he's the master. Um, but to get at that contradictory character of wokeism. You know, like, like, to, like, because they, they have some really irrational things and to kind of amplify that irrational aspect. So I'm, I'm still kind of, you know, um, working on that uh, to try to kind of bring out the best. Um, but it's, it's a difficult one because, you know, I have, you know, I can't because I got fired for that, for doing that. Um, and I don't like. I, I don't really know how I feel about this because I think it was very unfair, uh, obviously, that I was fired for that. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't I want to do I want to expose the hypocrisy and the irrationality. And sometimes it appears, you know, that just I'm trying to be mean or something like that. 
And, I, and that's not my intent. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to expose the ridiculousness of it. So, and it's a real skill. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not something I find easy. And I'm, I, I never I, thought it was ever mean. It just seemed like it was accurate based. It was, it just seems accurate based on what the criticism was. It was literally just repackaging what people had already well, said. That's what I did. And if they I are so embarrassed by their own, if they're so embarrassed by their own words, maybe they should say less of them. Uh, <laughs> but Oh, I guess as a la uh, last, uh, like last question, that would be maybe good. Is what what what's it been like to be an honorary member of the far right? Because that's what I always hear about Frances Whittleston no. is that she is a far right professor. Well, first of all, I'm a socialist uh, of the Orwellian uh, persuasion. So George Orwell, I guess, is the the figure that I most admire and I most model myself on. So it's it's kind of I don't understand how people are getting that except guilt by association, I guess. So because the left has been destroyed by reified postmodernism, le left wing used to be class analysis uh, and you know historical materialism, um, the labor theory of value. So working class politics uh, used to be what the left was all about. Class politics have nothing to do with wokeism at all. In fact, wokeism downgrades class just to another identity. It's far more concerned with trans activism, indigenization, promoting Islam, and so on. Um, so because the left is destroyed and is just woke, um, the right, people on the right, who would character, and I don't even know if people identify themselves as being right, we've got people like yourself, who's conservative, or people who are libertarian, um, and, you know, people perhaps who are white nationalists who misunderstand my message, um, you know, support me and uh, argue in favor of me, um, because they're doing that, that makes me, uh, makes them think that I have some kind of um, acceptance of, 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 the idea that inequality yeah. should 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 not be fought against or something like that, which is totally not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that um, indigenous people, especially that that's my major area of focus, indigenous people deserve the same level of education as all other people obtain in Canada, and they are being denied that by woke types of policies, which as you pointed out yourself, um, kind of assume that indigenous people are not capable of um, pursuing science or academic disciplines, just like everyone else, which I think is what, um, I'm not sure who coined that term, the racism of low expectations, that kind of idea. So um, my views are very pro-indigenous. I wanna make sure that indigenous people get the same level of services as everyone else and are not denied them, um, but because of the the whole opportunistic character of wokeism, um, it's easier just to uh, smear me as a racist and a right-wing yeah. person and so on. That, well, that, that's why I've, I've had so many people where I had to inform them, like, you guys realize that Francis is left wing and they're blown away. And they're like, no, she's not. They've taken <laughs> classes with you. And I think you even said it in a class that they are in, but they're too busy like rolling their eyes to be able to pay attention. Well, I guess because you keep getting accused of, of different academic forms of terrorism, you're like, Mount Royal's Emma Goldman. <laughs> well, it's uh, it is a problem of wokeism, and wokeism, uh, people who are not taking this seriously, need to think this through. It is going to destroy all the progress that we've made, all the intellectual progress that we made, and it is going to actually completely undermine left wing politics because people think that woke is left wing. And that is not true at all. Wokeism is a reactionary position that is intent on destroying all the gains that have been made um, in the Enlightenment. Well, it's it's even it even seems to have even poisoned, uh, I guess, right wing or center right sorts of thought too, because you get these people, and this is why I don't like populism, who then oppose woke ideas by saying that well, because people say that. Uh, people falsely accuse people of racism who are woke, then that means nobody can be racist <laughs> and that everything, every the concept of racism itself as an accusation is now completely debunked and we don't have to worry about having any standards because I then find, again, people on the right who overreact and now they just start saying, you know, 
people like Jeremy McKenzie. There's nothing wrong with them. You can find tapes of him saying that Herman Goring talked too much sense and was assassinated and stuff like that. But no, 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 no. That you like even noticing that stuff is a is now a left wing woke thing to do, which means that it's wrong. So they they'll I have people overcorrecting on both yeah, sides of the political well, spectrum. We need to be more rational, more critical, uh, critically analytical, and so on. Um, well, Wyatt, I think we have reached the two-hour period, so we could go on, I'm sure, for quite a long time still, but I think we are testing the, uh, you know, the attention span of our audience, so I think I will draw this to a close, and thank you very much uh, for appearing on the Rational Space Disputations. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Francis. Thanks a lot.